are you turned on, so to speak? <laughs> I'm absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to vi interview Vic because I never have. Um, and so, and when I was last in Rio, I very much wanted to interview him there, and he was traveling. So, thank you to Art and Embassies and the Hirshhorn for giving me this wonderful opportunity. On screen right now, we have a detail of Hybrid Forest, which is the part of the large mural that he's done for the American Embassy in Brazil. And we will discuss that work uh, at the end of our conversation. I was going to start with a few historical pieces um, and some basic questions. Uh, here on the left, we have Valentina, the, who is the fastest girl um, in the community of subjects that you were depicting. And she's made out of sugar. And we have Medusa Marinara, made out of spaghetti. And um, the, the question to ask might be, tell me about materials. But I want to start by asking you about representation, because I think there's a real joy of representation in a work. And often, part of the pleasure is the revelation of a figure who kind of emerges in an unexpected way. How do you choose your subject matter? Well, sometimes the, sh the subject matter chooses you. You know, I think we are preconditioned to find forms into forms. I think in, in Ovid's uh, Metamorphosis, the first line says that, you know, my soul is bent on finding forms within forms. I think this is probably what started the whole, uh, the whole thing about language. Every kind of symbolic exchange comes from the fact that one guy one day walked into a cave and he saw in the cracks on the wall something that he seemed to have seen before. Uh, he had to have some kind of uh, connection to something that he had seen before, otherwise he wouldn't be able to see it. It wasn't just cracks on the wall, it, it was just a form of an animal. Not any animal, an animal that he elaborated. He feels it looks like the animal we we killed last winter when we were very hungry. And all of a sudden, he has all the stories in his head about the taste of the animal, the party that he should he should afterwards, and then how everybody was happy to have eaten. And all of, he looked at it again; it was just cracked from the wall. And he picked something on the floor, some blunt thing, and completed that form. Uh, and all those images came back again. This is a story that's uh, you know 50,000 years old, and I think it hasn't. We're probably at the end of it right now. You know, and I can explain this a little bit later. But uh, the what we can call the picture project. You know, the reason uh, that, that we since this first artist. You know, we have continuously uh, have this place in society for individuals whose main occupation is to create tools and, and, and instruments that help us mediate our relationship to the outside world, you know, so, so to speak, that we, we, we can deal with the reality that's around us. And in our case, in, in, in our time, is a reality that uh, extends be, you know, farther than the, the, the reach of our, our immediate senses. I think, uh, uh, I always think about this first artist when I'm, I'm in, because I feel connected to him somehow. I'm sort of like advancing this project. The, the reason, and I think that we, um, the, way, the, the reason we see the things, the world around us, the way we see today, has to do with the parallel evolution with these instruments that we artists developed through history, you know, in order for us to, to, to be able to do so. It's a very important occupation, I think. I, I, I like to think of it. So it, it sounds very noble, but when you look at a plate of pasta, you know, it doesn't really connect. <laughs> but You're, Can I ask, because you often refer to famous works of art, and the Medusa here echoes Caravaggio's Medusa. And, uh, but you also have a history of depicting people from the street who might never have the opportunity to have their portrait done. And so there's a kind of tension, perhaps, between uh, you know, high and uh, low income, 
you know, I, I trained as a British sociologist, so I'm always sniffing out class wherever I can find it. Um, do, you, do you think that there's a kind of the theme of class lingering behind your choice of subject matter? I wish I was that organized. I'm, a, I'm not a sociologist. <laughs> I'm, I'm an artist, you know. So uh, I guess, uh, you know, when I'm, usually I'm introduced as the artist who works with non-orthodox materials. and. Then, I've, I find it, I, I'm always very concerned about, uh, once I heard somebody, I was in the museum watching people look at my work and then they said, oh, that's the chocolate guy. And I'm like, Come on, man. I worked for 20 years to be the chocolate guy. Uh, I, I, the reason I work with this variety of uh, materials and I, I do. I, I'm very. I do. I work indiscriminately about what uh, if it's somebody famous, or if it's an icon, or if it's an unknown. It's because it it allows me to do a, a really wide range of experimentation. If you work with a, uh, a pencil and a paper uh, and an eraser, you're just going to be doing the same thing every day of your life. You know, not that that's. I have nothing against that, but uh, the fact that you you choose to work with uh, chocolate or diamonds or garbage or having retro diggers do these really huge drawings in the, on the iron mines and have helicopters to picture it or work with really state-of-the-art microscopes making pictures of castles in grains of dust uh, allows me to explore different processes. You know, it's not really, uh, it's not the chocolate or the, it's just the way you have to go to come up with a picture that's made very fast in the case of chocolate or very, takes very long to make. Sometimes, I, you know, I make the, the Medusa marinara that you saw before. That wasn't supposed to be a piece. I was eating, you know? <laughs> and I actually, I was looking at a book by Caravaggio that I was making another work by cho chocolate. Then I, I, had, I saw like, I did that, I put a little, a drop of, uh, of olive oil for the eyes to make look really vivid. I said, oh, that looks good. I photographed it, and I remember, I, then I found out that I was supposed to have a show uh, about apparitions that this, this friend of mine, uh, uh, Leslie Thornton, and then I, I, I was, uh, Leslie Tonkono, sorry. And then I, I, she said, oh, I have a piece, I have a piece. I sent it to her, and my plate of food, like in the, Seven days later, was in the, in the three quarters of the New York Times. <laughs> I was like, I was like, wow, this is this is really magic, you know. I, 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 uh, but then you do something that takes three minutes to do, and then there are works that I, in which I'm. Turn off your phones, huh? It's my ex-wife. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, and then you do, uh, you do uh, work that I manipulate with, the, with dental tools, grain by grain, bits of pigment, you know? And you, you end up making, it takes like four months to do it. To do that, I have to wear a mask and gloves and goggles because if I breathe out, all that picture turns into a cloud of smoke. Ugly color, too. Uh, and if I breathe in, I die because it's all poison, you know? <laughs> so, it, it, and you do that for six months and, and then when it's in the gallery, you show that Medusa and you, sell, you have to sell them for the same price. It's so, un <laughs> so unfair. <laughs> because you, you, you charge by, by, you know, by inch. You know? <laughs> so, I still have to understand that. The, I, I think um, your choice of materials is one of the things that makes your work accessible, isn't it? In a way, just by using a, a common material that everyone can identify with it, you are kind of bringing Caravaggio to people who might other, not otherwise clock the Medusa. And I try to work with things that are very known uh, fr from the iconography and from the material. I think uh, with, uh, you know, the artists only do half of the work. The other half is the viewer who does. I mean, I, I, I always think of art happening in the museum or in the gallery and not in the studio walls. When, the, when it's there, it's just a personal thing that I do with it. I really don't, don't go much farther. But when somebody's in front of the artwork or, the, or that thing that you did, then you can really realize for sure if that's art or not, you know? And I, I um, 
So it, you, since the spectator is doing half of the work, you have to be considered of, considerable of, of what that person is bringing into that bargain. What's the, the visual baggage? Normally, we, uh, and I, I love to, I hate when I go to a show and I have a feeling that I, I, I don't want, I feel stupid about it, you know, that I get that. I didn't understand anything. So I, leaving a gallery with the feeling that you're dumb, uh, I prefer to give the other uh, sensations. When you look at it and you discover that you know a lot more than what you actually, you, you thought you did. Um, visual culture is something that we start acquiring when we're like just a few days old. You know, the moment we start differentiating between this blur, which must be, I honestly think, of how, I don't remember when it was when I was a baby, but it was like, must have been like an acid trip. It was crazy, you know? <laughs> and, like, and then the moment you start thinking, this is light, this is dark, this is mom, this is me, language starts kicking in and the world starts becoming departmentalized and in, in, in broken into this web of linguistic, that sort of, in a way, stands between us and the real world. That's why uh, um, the moment we start acquiring uh, uh, language and start learning numbers, then uh, we stop drawing and stop having this more it's this direct relationship that children have, you know, to the, to the visual world. I, somebody, some people ask me, you know, when did you start becoming an artist? I don't remember when I start, but I remember when everybody around me stopped being one. And it was around <laughs> that time, you know. <clears throat> I'm dyslexic, so it took me uh, a long time to learn how to read and write, and it was exactly the time when people stopped playing with Play-Doh and, and, you know, and, and drawing. I couldn't write, so I started, when I took dictation in, in the second year, you know, the person said, Carl, you know, I, I couldn't write it, I would just draw something. I could only draw, write, in cert, uh, read in certain fonts, I could not, so I, I do everything visually. So by, when I was, uh, uh, like eight or nine, my copy books looked like the Egyptian section of the Metropolitan Museum. It was like a, <laughs> there was a, a, like sh a short hand, you know, that I, I was the only one who could uh, read those things. But, uh, it, but you know, it, th that, those things developed gradually into more uh, accomplished drawings. And before I knew, I was the kid who draws. Every one of you had a kid like this in the class, the guy who makes the caricatures of the teachers, pass them around. And that would became my identity, you know. So uh, I think that's how things develop. And speaking of drawing, um, we have up here a work from 1996, and I think the translation is Dreamer. Um, and so I'm wondering about drawing. You clearly you're a very accomplished colorist, but it seems to me that drawing is your kind of primary root. Skill, your earlier work seems to rely more on drawing than your current work, and it sounds like you did a lot of drawing as a kid. Well, if you, it, it, when I was talking about that guy 45, 50,000 years ago, you know, what he, he, start, he started doing drawing. The first ways we, we were able to consolidate images, you know, just like outlines of certain shapes. And it's a very primitive rendering, but that's, I find that fascinating because uh, it's, you know, I could, there are people today working at the very end of the technological spectrum of uh, creating simulations, creating, uh, you know, uh, illusions like, you know, Spielberg, um, uh, you know, DreamWorks. I don't have that kind of money. I don't have that many rich friends, so I have to work on the other side. So uh, my deal is to produce the worst possible illusion that's still able to fool people. Not actually, because then, then, then you're not fooling people. You're actually giving people a measure of their own need to be fooled, you know, their own, their own belief. Um, every single uh, form of language requires that you let yourself be fooled temporarily by something else like you are listening to the sound that's coming out of my mouth and, it, and you're finding meaning in it. It's just sound, you know? Um, pictures are like this too. Uh, and they are, uh, when it comes to drawing, you're dealing at the very, very end of that, the, the worst possible illusion. So if I do like this, you know, and I do this, I didn't even draw it, but every one of you saw in this gesture a picture of the sun. 
Well, the sun is a huge ball of fire that's hanging eight light minutes from here. And I brought it to this room only with a gesture. For people 40,000 years ago who didn't have Nintendo, this was magic. Believe me, they would go like, whoa, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, it's known that they, some, some churches, they didn't allow uh, frescoes to be uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Renaissance to be placed very at the eye level because people could just bang their noses against it. They would believe that, you know, perspective is space and just go into it. You know, we, as I said, we developed our relation to the world based on our relationship to the tools that we, we invented to, to be able to foster that relationship. And artists, I mean, when the shortest explanation that I have about what art is, is the, the, is the evolution of our relationship, of the interface between mind and matter. You know? The only problem with this definition is that it, it, it can be applied to science and religion, <laughs> which at one point were the same thing. You know? I think, uh, uh, and if I have a, I love to work with scientists, you know? and I like to talk to religious people. I like to work with science more than I like to talk with religious people. <laughs> but uh, but, it, one, but it, it's, it's fascinating how uh, in all these, circun all these situations you're dealing with something very basic, to, very unique to our species, which is belief. Mm -hmm. Every single living thing you know, knows something. But we are the only species capable of believing something. You know, because uh, artists like us, we have created models of, uh, you know, we work with things that don't have much, uh, uh, we, we work in the realm of the irrelevant, you know. We, we do things that don't really apply to, directly to reality. We play. And playing, you know, is a, is a very important thing because you, you create possibilities for things that haven't happened yet. So you create extensions both uh, spatial and temporal. I think it's a, I, I can, cannot emphasize how important my work is. <laughs> I mean, it's like a. Uh, On that note, um, I'd like to reinforce the point by uh, asking you to talk about the kind of social practice part of your work. Um, in Rio, uh, you did this huge, kind of monumental uh, body of work uh, in this dump uh, in which 70% of Rio de Janeiro's trash ended up and uh, made work with recyclables along with the workers who picked through the dump to find uh, recyclable material and also it featured in this documentary. Um, I'm really fascinated by the way you engage people and how you, you don't just transform materials, you actually transform lives. And I wondered if you saw kind of human beings as one of your many materials. Well, that's a scary thought. <laughs> <coughs> but I, I, I think it goes a little bit beyond that. Um, I, I've been working for 20, over 25 years doing this. And when you're a young artist, you just, well, you're only doing art because you want to be an artist, you know? So you make art to be an artist. No, you're not an artist to make art. Uh, and uh, after, I don't know, 20 years, you don't have that excuse anymore. Oh, I want to be an artist. You know, you've been paying your bills for a long time. You, you've been in shows, you're doing retrospectives. You even get a catalog resume of your work. And uh, so why do you do this? You know, what's, what is that that you're doing? Uh, and it's important not just to be reminded. You can, I talk to myself, I'm my only child, so I, I talk to myself all the time. Um, I like it, now, now the car, the cell phones are great, because when they're having cars, now I can talk to myself when I'm driving, people think I'm talking on the phone, it's really <laughs> good. But I, I, but I cannot convince myself of this importance unless if I do something. And what I did around the time uh, I was, because uh, I had, I was just done a retrospective and a really thick book of my work, so you go back to everything you've done. And then I, I was, I, I said like, well, what is it, you know? So I invited a group of people who have absolutely no relationship to art whatsoever. They, 
They have no relationship to images of themselves. Uh, for the most part, they only see themselves in the mirror or in the tiny little pictures from cell phones they found in the garbage dump. Uh, they had, obviously, from the environment, the kind of work that they performed, uh, uh, very issues, in, really incredible issues with self-esteem, uh, their, their role in society, and so on. And I invited these people to come and come to my studio and work on their own self-portraits, but in a huge scale, you know, in, in just in the way I, I've always been working. So the portraits are kind of, they, they're, you don't see them when you're working on them. They are uh, anamorphic and they're, ex they're elongated and, and trapezoidal like this. But when you go up to a tower 20 meters high, all of a sudden you see yourself huge. It's three, two times this auditorium or more, and you see a picture of yourself. And, but I didn't want to add anything. I didn't want to give them materials like, uh, that were foreign to them. I wanted to take the portraits with the materials that they work with every day, which is basically you know, recyclables and, and garbage. And, and, and at the end of this process, which it took three years, you know, I had not only changed my convictions about what I did, but also I realized the importance of this to these people. Uh, they were different people, completely different people. And for those of you who haven't seen the documentary, it's it's a really it's a really good documentary. It's not because I did it, okay? And it's, it's a, a good documentary. See. It really I, is. It was indicated for the Oscar, and they, it was a huge injustice. They didn't give it to us. I wanted to get that the the Oprah the Oprah announced, and I was so disappointed. Uh, Inside Job One. Remember that film about Wall Street? So we made a film about how to turn garbage into money, and they gave the Oscar to a film about how to turn money into garbage. <laughs> and I was like, uh, but, uh, but the, the, I, I think uh, Wasteland was, a, it was really a project to, it was, it was a process of trying to understand what is this that I did. And it was, I, I, it changed my, it also set me into like a, a, a being more open to do projects like this. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, share what I do with people. And I, as I said to you, I make things so I can see people looking at them. You know, I don't make work for myself. Artists say that, they're lying, you know. Once, there's a very, very famous artist that I, which I admire a lot. She's not, she, she died, but I loved her work. I'm not gonna say who it is. But uh, once I went to a lecture and she said that, uh, you know, well, I only make work for myself, and I raised my hand, and I said, well, why do you make additions then? <laughs> and then she never spoke to me again <laughs> until she died. <laughs> but I, I, I think uh, we, I, it's, but this time, I was not sharing the results of what I was doing, I was sharing the process. You know, if you think looking at art is something very important, that, making art or being in the process of creating something. It's, it's exhilarating when, when it goes well, especially, you know? When it doesn't go well, because you know, when you have this, we, these books, these retrospectives, we only show things that work. Uh, we never show the things that don't work. You know, the, but failure is a, is a major asset in, because things don't work here, you use it somewhere else. Like this, the thread piece that was before, you know, it takes about uh, a week to make one. And then, this uh, one. yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. And then you f you you make it, it and then you photograph it. And then it has it's interesting because when you look at it, you have two kinds of pictures sort of fighting against. One has a pictorial uh, perspective, and the other has a, like a textural perspective or, or it's topographic. You know, I had just finished one of these pieces. It, it, the, the, I, I I named these pieces by the number of yards of thread that I use. So this is like, it's, a, it's called the Dreamer, but it's called like 16,000 yards of thread. Uh, it's funny that uh, Meg knows that uh, we, we make this, if I make one that's 10,000 yards of thread, then it's very beautiful, and I make one that's 21 yards of thread, that's not that good, people will want the one that has more thread in it. <laughs> you know, and that collectors do it. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I just had just made one of these, and I said, well, I'm gonna have lunch, and then I come back and shoot it. I, I had a cat. <laughs> that cat is no longer with us. <laughs> the, I came back, the cat collaborated, and he made an abstraction out of my you know, 19th century copy. 
<laughs> but things, you know, uh, once I spent like one month and a half making a, a, a piece with, uh, with pigment, you know, the ones that I described before, and then by the time I was about to shoot the piece, it was done. I shoot with an 8x10 camera, the lenses uh, are sort of placed in there's a latch that holds the lenses to the, uh, to the bellows of the camera. I, when I, I put it down, when I picked up the, the shutter, it did this, the, my sleeve caught the latch and the lenses fell right on top of it. And I was like, <laughs> I had to sit for like 20 minutes, just looking at that. You know when your legs are like, you get all numb, you know? That obviously is not in my retrospective. <laughs> but. So just so you know, before I move to the next slide, Wasteland, you can see it on iTunes or Amazon. It's, you know, Oh, it's for free to... on, on YouTube, too. <laughs> <laughs> and I paid $3.99, so, you know. Um, now, we have this term public art, uh, which begs the question, what do we call all the art that's not public? Private art, collector art, elite art, art world insider art, studio art? How do you define the public? Yeah, I, think, I, know, I didn't think about that, but you're right. I mean, how art, if, if it depends on somebody looking at it, it has to be public to be art, I think. Uh, it's just a, a, about the different venues that we, we find. Uh, we are used to have images coming at us. You know, they're projected through TV screens, telephones, outdoor uh, billboards, uh, you know, point of sale, product packaging, um, and this, these are images that are everywhere. They're ominous. They're, 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 so, and then you have museums. It, it's an inversion. So it, it, it's, museums are like these places where you can ritualize your relationship to images because you walk towards an image. You know, you wake up, you take a shower, you put uh, your nice clothes, black clothes to go to the museum. <laughs> and then, you, and then you, you take a, a bus and you pay to get in or you, it's for free. You just walk and you walk towards that picture, you know? It's something that I always like to do. You know, you know, you, I, well, there's a picture and, and you want to see, it's a, it's a landscape. Right? And you walk towards that picture and you stop there as, as if there's an X on the floor and you, you do this, like. <laughs> you know? The reason you do this is by the time you stop is because that picture filled your you know, visual field comfortably. And you can be inside the landscape if you do this, and you can be back in the museum if you do this. And when you do this, you're looking at a picture that's uh, something that comes from the mind of an artist. It's something idealized. It's part of somebody's imagination or a negotiation with some nature. But it's virtually an idea. When you go this, you see material. You see what that idea is made of. And you go back and forth between idea and material, idea and material, because the experience of art does not reside in either end of the bargain, but exactly on the moment you cross that threshold. It's when you feel the relationship between what's here and what's out around you. This is the, the just really thick wall that separates you know, our consciousness to everything that's happening outside. We have the impression that we have full control of that because we are given very powerful tools to deal with that. That beyond this uh, theater, uh, there is a museum and there is a city. And we can think of everything that's happening outside in, the, in our planet and even beyond in our universe. You know? But in fact, uh, uh, these are just <clears throat> you know, things that we, we, the realities that we create for ourselves. But we can quite feel them, you know. Um, I am a wall artist, I make objects, and I f my works require physical presence for them to exist, for them to work. This is a, a the, I think it's, the, it's a handicap of the artwork, because you need to go there to see it, to feel the transformation. Every image has some cinematic feel that as you approach it, it changes. But you have to be there, you know. So I don't post my work on my Instagram account because I don't want to you know, trivialize the experience of looking at it. I post cats, food, and sunsets. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, but um, public art, you know? I forgot the question, see, it was public art. Um, um, 
I wonder, I, you know, I, I think that the physicality of art, I like to think of it not as a handicap, but as the thing that will remind us that we have these bodies. Because, you know, everything seems to be digitizable, but wonderfully, art, we still want to experience at scale with its textures and all that kind of thing. And communally, too. I mean, the number one people go, number one reason people go to museums is to socialize. Number two is to learn something. It's you like know? movies, yeah. And I go to museums so I can get shushed. <laughs> <laughs> I go to movies so I feel shh, because I keep commenting. Why, why would, you know, if you don't talk about it, what's the point of, you know, watching it with other people? I never understood that. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I think uh, what is, there are two, well, I was saying about uh, the, uh, one mode of when you ritualize your experience with things that are, but then, uh, see, I, I come from a very poor family in Brazil. My parents, the first time they set foot on a museum or in a gallery was to see one of my shows. And the reason they never did it is because they didn't know what they would find inside. They were not familiar with that. Um, it is a well-known fact that people who grow around art, you know, I mean, public art, they have less, less of a problem to walk into, inside, inside a museum or to participate in a discussion because they feel familiarized. People with even popular culture, you know, I, I had a show in Mexico City and there was a huge crowd coming in and these people, they, they're immersed in like a folk uh, art and they had the really best reactions to the work, you know, completely different. And that's why we, we show the work in different for different cultures to see how it, uh, it fares, you know, or, or how people see it differently. Um, to my, uh, to my I, I, I'm very happy that it doesn't change much, you know. I, I still make work for my mother, actually. I, I make work that has a sort of a universal appeal. It's very hard to impress very intelligent, it's very easy to impress very intelligent people only, you know. And then I, when I make a, an exhibition, I. I love when uh, the museum director or the curator is there and they say, oh, it's, I really think it's good and I think we did this and then you, they are enjoying the show and then the, the guard comes to you, I like that one over there, <laughs> you know? Or the, the, the maintenance people, they come and they have a, a, a genuine reaction to, to what you're doing. But, um, but this isn't a museum, as I said. It's just like you go there and you know what you're gonna find. Or even if you don't, you know that you're going to be tricked or surprised. That's the controlled environment. The gallery is the same thing. But when you're walking on the street and you bump into something unexpectedly, you know, uh, I remember I, I was in, in, lived in New York during the time Richard Serra did that, you know, what's the name, Tilted Ark, you know, in the downtown. And it was a very huge polemic because they, people wanted the sculpture to be removed and it was commissioned work of art. But I had to cross that place all the time. Going around that thing was very, very annoying, you know? I mean, I, 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 Richard Serra is my favorite sculptor, but he could make a little door in the middle, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, it's just like something very seamless, you know? Such as, um, <laughs> so I, I'm saying that because I think when you deal with that kind of public art, you have to be fully conscious of, of the context in which you're doing that thing and what that is doing to the people around. It's, just like, it's not like just doing something in the gallery and replacing a different scale to another place. Um, the first uh, public art that I did- Can I ask you very specifically about a context? How about um, this work that's in the New York subway, the new line up the Upper East Side? Can you tell us a bit about that context? Because I think, um, you talk about infected context, and yeah. I love that term because it's it's those contexts that are kind of much richer in social meaning than let's say an empty well, gallery space. Yeah, because it, it's it's uh, you, you have a, people in a different mindset. You know, people blank themselves when they go to a gallery because they're open to the, to an experience. When they're riding the subway, they have all kinds of concerns. You know, time being time. Uh, or lateness, or too many people, they're conscious of the environment around. Uh, you know, I'm gonna do a Brazilian politician thing, I'm gonna answer a completely different question. <laughs> Just to, to finish my point before. Uh, uh, and it has to do with this, I promise. I, it's uh, the first public art I ever done, I did it for a creative time in 2001, 
I asked the plane to draw these cartoony clouds on the sky over Manhattan. And because I didn't want that interference, you know, that the Richard Serra thing that I was saying, like, I didn't want to make something that would stay there. And it was quite interesting because a cloud is something that you expect to find in the sky, but never as a drawing. So the plane would make that drawing, all of a sudden you, it moves with the wind going like this. You go, oh, wow, you know? <laughs> and, and it's not selling anything, it's just a cloud going like this. It was really silly, but it was like, a, it's, it's a very interesting experience. It makes you awake a little bit. Um, in this case, it's the opposite, you know? I, 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 then I said, I don't want to make things that have a, a, that last too long, people get tired of it. But then I, I think I changed my mind with time, because time is also a very, adds a different dimension to the work. Um, when you make uh, work like uh, the, 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 the work in the, in, the, in, the, in the subway, you have to be conscious that that thing will stay there for a long time. But you also have to be fully conscious of what that is doing, you know? I initially, I had another proposal for the M MTA. It was, I, I was working with lenticular. Uh, remember those, uh, those pens that you go like this, and then when you go like this, the woman that's in the pit gets naked, you know, like, <laughs> yeah? That technology, very, very, very powerful technology. Uh, I, I made these lenticular prints, they were big, and they were also uh, uh, anamorphic, so if you, you were walking on the train station, all of a sudden you see a ghost appear and dematerialize and you'll be freak out everybody, I promise. <laughs> Obviously, I could, it was an idea that was very hard to sell. <laughs> they said no, but they liked the idea that uh, what I was representing were just people there in uh, inert, just waiting. The idea of somebody waiting has to do with like Egyptian sculpture. You know? Egyptian sculpture, it's not going anywhere. That's why most of them are sitting down. Uh, they are, it's about sharing time with a, and it's a fellow passengers of people. There's also this transitional moment, you know, and I, I, I ride the trains and I kind of enjoy that. So they said, can you actually make the people visible? And for me to make a, a leap from like a, making working with a photograph to working with straight into mosaic, I had to do a lot of soul searching because I, I, I is, is that part of my work? And then Lester from the MTA he said, you've been always been, you've always been a, a mosaic artist, you know, because you always create a distinction between material and image, between making something out of something else, you know. And, and I, I, I said, okay, good. That's a good explanation. I'm going to buy it, <laughs> and I'm going to make it. And I found this uh, group of people in Munich that uh, could really do amazing photorealistic uh, glass mosaic. And we did 40... Uh, characters in, in the, the entire mezzanine of the 72nd uh, station of the 2nd Avenue line. And it really works because it has a, what was before it was an apparition, then became a presence. They are life size. I made an effigy of myself and I kept putting on the station looking from different uh, angles. And people always think artists are crazy, but they were not. Uh, so so to, see, to see if, if you, normally when you make a representation of yourself. You've seen statues that are done one-to-one -one scale, that people look like midgets. Uh, that, I was afraid of that, so, and then we, what we did, we, we actually made the shadows behind using the, the regular tile of the station. That was the hardest part, because uh, um, we, to get the tile of the station and make that, that, the shadow, the tiles warped, you know, you're dealing with temperature. Um, when you're, there's a, there's a great degree of specialization that the contemporary artists have to deal with when working with processes and materials that uh, you would take a lifetime to learn how to, to master. So you have to deal with other people. So then the skills of the artist is basically communicating very clear ideas and trying to follow it through. Uh, when you deal, work with somebody who makes glass in Murano, like for instance, I just did the project, you don't know how to blow glass, but you have to be able to, you know, the guy speaks Italian. Sometimes it's, it's a tricky little thing, but, uh, but in this case, uh, we, we, the great, the, 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 the main deal was to create a really effective line of communication with the fabricator, and I, I was very happy with, with the results. Uh, and when I became a, a, a mosaic artist, you know, uh, the invitation came uh, to do this piece, 
which is a, a completely different context. It's not a train station. It's, a, it's an embassy. Uh, it's a, in it, it's a, has a, I had to think about a number of things, of, of personal issues even, before I, 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 I decided to, to do or not, and what to do about this, you know. Uh, and it's called Hybrid Forest, and it's both the Everglades and the Amazon, which uh, makes sense for Braz the American Embassy in Brazil, but also your national identity as a dual citizen, yeah. both Brazilian and American. And you were an illegal alien for a little while in America? <laughs> Let's say. <laughs> I were. I was. How, I was. How did, how did that history and sense of citizenship affect your well, choices? Well, when you? the word at embassy, a consulate, you know, you're talking of uh, this kind of ambiguous spaces that validate your presence in one place or another. Um, the, the American citizens here, probably you don't feel it, or maybe you do feel it. I'm an American citizen, I still feel it, but maybe it's a residue of my experience as, a, as an immigrant going through customs, for instance, you know? And the guys start asking too many questions and you start going like, ooh, you know? But uh, it's, it's an interesting, it's, it's a tense environment. Um, and it's a place like, it, it's like a, you're in between, if you're crossing that threshold. It is, a, it is a, an environment that represents a threshold. A wall, you know? It's a wall. And how to transform a wall into a bridge. Uh, I think that was the, the, the main, how to, I, I really love to hear from the, you know, the entire process of, of you know, we, in which of the, the, the idea to invite artists to work on embassies come out because of the fact that after uh, September 11, the increasing amount of security that was put in place in embassies and consulates sort of altered the original architecture of most of these buildings and sort of like made them a little bit uh, oppressive and dehumanized. Bringing art back into this place was a way to balance uh, a little bit these changes. I really liked, that was the real appeal. I said, that's really interesting because that's how I feel when I'm in one of these places. And, uh, and one thing, I don't know, if you've been to Brasilia, Brasilia is a very funny place. It was designed by one, a couple of guys, you know. Uh, they had some beer, they said, let's do this airplane thing. And they designed the entire thing in one go. And it's like, it doesn't, it's not organic. It doesn't allow growth. It's, everything is already taught, it's done, it's, you know. In a number of ways, it's dead, you know. Um, and I, I found, feel that to, to make something that it's refreshingly, opposite to that, something that is out of, you know, control. Forests are like that. And uh, I think also the forest would convey a feeling that is a common or origin for all of us. We all come from nature. It's a place where we bind. We are natural beings. We're animals. Uh, and all of a sudden, but we, when we are in front of nature, we don't know what we're dealing with. We're so illiterate when it comes to nature. Uh, to make a forest that was a tricky forest, as a sort of a mosaic, a conceptual mosaic, because we went through all the species that did not occur. They were either from the Everglades and they do not, they do not exist in the Amazon, or from the Amazon and do not exist, and we mix them up, and we create a forest that is an impossible forest. But nobody noticed that. <laughs> um, you know, to go back to, you know, like with the idea of politics, I think, uh, uh, Obviously, I have my opinions as a, as a citizen, you know, and as an artist, but they're not better than the opinions of the policeman or the baker or the candlestick maker. I mean, it's just that uh, I think uh, artists, I don't know, I, I really, uh, I, sometimes I, I, I'm very suspicious of artists that think they know more about politics than other people, you know. Actually, we live in another planet, you know. We don't, we shouldn't even be allowed to vote sometimes, I think. <laughs> I mean, uh, we, you know, uh, and I, I, I think uh, we're very, uh, I, if every time politics or good intentions are a premise to make art, I think you rob yourself of an essential point that these things come from the possibility of communicating ideas. They don't precede it. 
You know, and the, if there is anything political about making art, it's the fact that you allowing people to be conscious of their relationship to reality, which is very much in peril right now. I think we are, we're uh, technology advanced in such pace that artists and, and people who think about image could not really uh, you know, follow. We're a little bit falling behind and uh, we're losing somehow our grip to things that are real, things that are true. Where do we get uh, our doses of reality from? And, uh, and it's, a, it's a symptomatic thing, it's everywhere. You know, it's here, it's in Brazil. And I think it comes from the fact that we need some serious adjustment. And uh, I don't think artists can provide that anymore. Uh, so can I clarify? Because you seem to be arguing that um, artists should not be kind of political illustrators or didacts. But on, by, by the same token, I'm assuming that you don't think there's a that artists can be, there's any stance they could have which is entirely apolitical either. And I've actually just put up Jackson Pollock for you as a side <laughs> note to this thought. Oh, he was having fun doing that. <laughs> I think uh, uh, art becomes political by the, with the extent that it connects with reality. You know, I think uh, uh, when you have art that's done uh, that somehow summarize the relationship that you have with things at that particular time in history, when you do it effectively and you make people sense it. You know, I was, uh, um, I was talking about this today at the National Gallery. So I have these pictures that are made out of a myriad of little pictures. You know, I just get them from magazines or art books and then I make a picture out of other pictures. And the intention there is actually to make people see an image that's very much like the way they produce images inside their brains, you know? When you make that, those connections, I think you are doing something political one way or another, you're helping, you know? And sometimes um, you just, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to, to not to go through so, some narratives that are political by nature. Like with the Sugar Children, for instance, these are kids that were uh, sons and daughters from, uh, uh, people who work in plantations, of sugar, uh, sugar cane plantations in the Caribbean. Uh, so I worked with them, I made the pictures out of sugar, but it turns out that I, I was, at the, the beginning of the idea wasn't, uh, you know, protest or, or, or I, I grew up in a, during a military dictatorship, and I, I think uh, when you grow, I, I wasn't a direct victim of the dictatorship, but I was a product of the cultural environment that it fostered. I mean, when you are in, a, in that kind of uh, censorship and, and very oppressive uh, political environment, you cannot just say things. Uh, the way, you cannot say what you think. You have to use metaphors. You have to really use all the elasticity the language allows to be able to pass uh, messages through. And also, <clears throat> When it comes to acquiring information, especially from official sources, it becomes very pragmatic. So I'm, the, the, my upbringing during the military dictatorship made me both a cynical and somebody very, uh, very good with metaphors or very aware of the elasticity of language, how you, many ways you can say something. Um, I think uh, uh, if you, uh, that, I, I mean, I. I almost try to avoid political statements, but I try to work with the mechanisms with political statements are made of. I, I also, you know, I have a commercial art background. I, I work with advertising. Uh, when, it's funny that, uh, you know, people in advertising, they steal all the ideas from artists. You know, you go to an ad agency, they have art books with, full of post-its like this. See, I steal ideas from advertising people. I, I just take it back from them. And I think there's, there's, no, no, there's no prejudice, you know, that I think the, the first, I think, uh, requirement when you, especially because, you know, you're dealing, there are two major industries working with visual culture at this moment, uh, advancing the idea of visual culture. One of them has distribution uh, uh, technology and capital, which is marketing and advertising. Uh, lobbying, and then the other one is contemporary art. We don't have any of that, but we have an enormous amount of freedom, you know? We don't have to sell anything, we sell the thing itself. 
we sell ideas, you know. But I think there's a symbiosis that, you know, these people make an enormous chunk of our, of our environment, you know, like, uh, you know, just a, going to the supermarkets, that it's, it's like you're, you're immersed in marketing, you know, and that experience should be part of what the landscape that the artist is trying to, to explain. In a, in a number of ways, that, I mean, I, I, I've said that I feel like a, a easel painter. You know, like people did it in the Barbizon in the 19th century. They, but my landscape is different, you know, and describing a different uh, environment, which is based on these, you know, references. And, and they're very, very complex and very powerful. And it's, uh, to be able to mirror that world, it's, it's sometimes it's very, one of the things you have to do, you have to be pace yourself. You have to not to try to, to do too many ideas at once or not mm -hmm. to be overly didactic. I, tend, I have a tendency to be overly didactic, you know. I'm trying to avoid this right now. <laughs> but I... Well, um, I think we have to move on to questions. Okay. Um, I mean, it's, I'd l love to hear further about what you think the, the political impact or the, just the emotional impact of the forest image is for people standing in that very long line at the American embassy in Brasilia. Yeah, this, you know, people, when you are in an in a embassy or in a consulate line, you have to stand a long time. Uh, sometimes you're exposed to weather and everything. I, I you know, also, you know, this, I, I keep thinking, which is much easier to think like that, is that if, how, if, what, how would I feel, you know? I felt if there was a forest there, I'll feel much better being there on that line. So I think, you know, I thought of flowers, but flowers, they're not, they're too, it would be too uh, camp and maybe uh, too pretentious. I don't know, it'd be too, they're too cultural, you know, so I, something more chaotic as a forest. And there's something quite nice about the, the mosaic is that it matches the trees that are behind it. So it somehow, somewhat it creates a fake sense of transparency, you know. The, the outside the wall, there's a street, there are cars, there are things going on, but then it just matches the top of the trees there, and then you feel like there's a, a forest that extends forever there. It's two things. Um, I have nothing against art that's pleasing, really. You know, when I say I still make art for my mother, I really mean it, you know. I, I, I like to make art for people who Sometimes they do not expect to see art. They don't know anything about it. Um, there's, a, there's a way to build uh, a structure around art making that, first of all, you privilege a, a physical reaction, something that's perceptual, it's sensorial. And if you are able to uh, create a connection between the viewer and the artwork at that, at that level, you know, all the rest is guaranteed. So you first, you, you know, you have to, you look at images like that, thousands of images every day. If an image managed to go like, hey, look at me, you know, and you, you do look at it, that's an enormous achievement. I mean, uh, this thing is, nobody can escape it. So it's going to be, it's, a, it's almost environmental. But I, as, as much as like the pictures in the, in the um, train station, you know, I, when you're dealing with these environments, they're very, they perform very specific, specific functions. I, first of all, I, I try to put myself in the position of the viewer and, and find out how could, what would that be doing and how could they be helping the experience of the people in that particular place. On that wonderful note, thank you so much, Dick, for being such a great speaker. Thank you. Thank you.